Hey guys, my name is Shreyas and welcome to Simple Biology. In this video, we're going to be looking at the selective permeability, permeability of membranes. So what is selective permeability? I think the best way of actually talking about selective permeability of membranes is to actually look at the structure of the membrane. Now we have a very extensive video that we've made about the structure of the membrane, which you might want to go check out if you have never ever uh, seen this diagram before. So go ahead and check out our membrane structure video. If you've never seen this diagram before right here, you might want to go check this out because we talk extensively about uh, this diagram and how this is actually a membrane uh, on a microscopic level. So if you have never seen this a diagram down here before, you might want to go check out this membrane structure video. But you, if you have seen this diagram, I think that uh, this will just be a review and you'll be actually you'll actually be able to understand what selective permeability actually is. So just as a review, let's uh, we remember that the that the membrane is actually a lipid bilayer, a lipid bilayer. And the lipid bilayer consists of phospholipids, 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 and the phospholipids are amphipathic, which means that they have a polar end, and typically this polar end is referred to as the head of the a phospholipid, and then it also has a non-polar region. And that region is typically referred to as the tail or the chain of a phospholipid. Okay, so since that since we have a polar head, that polar head is going to be hydro. It's kind of hard to fit this in here. Hydrophilic, meaning it's going to mix well with water. And then the non-polar end, basically the tail, is going to be hydrophobic hydrophobic, meaning it won't mix well with water. So the way the lipids, the phospholipids arrange themselves within the lipid bilayer is that the hydrophilic heads, the hydrophilic heads are going to go on the outside over here of the cell membrane because remember um, in a cell membrane we have water on this side and we have water on this side so the part of the phospholipid which is actually going to interact with the water is the head Therefore, the head is on the outside, and then the hydro, the hydrophobic tails are going to be on the inside over here. If you look closely, you can see all the tails kind of just uh, jumbled up together like this, and that's because uh, they are hydrophobic, meaning they don't want to be um, in contact with the water, so they're going to go ahead and remain on the inside. Okay, so we understand that. Now, what is selective permeability? So selective permeability refers to actually the whether or not a molecule is going to actually, uh, a molecule or any substance for the matter, is going to cross over the membrane. Okay, so because the membrane has this huge hydrophobic region right here, typically the only types, and also because the phospholipids, uh, as you can see, are so bunched up together, typically the only types of molecules that are actually going to be able to cross over the membrane uh, like this are, are small molecules and nonpolar molecules. Okay, because small molecules, because again, the phospholipids are so closely bunched together that, you know, you can't have like a large molecule like this trying to like pass through, it's just not going to fit. And uh, nonpolar molecules, because we have a hydrophobic region in the middle over here, and uh, if you have a molecule just polar, it's not going to be able to pass through that hydrophobic region. So examples of molecules like this, uh, let me give you a few examples, are uh, CO2. Okay, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a small, relatively small molecule, and it's also nonpolar. Um, oxygen, O2, is a small molecule, and it's nonpolar. Uh, let me think of other examples, which we'll find in biology. Um, for right now, I think these are these two are good, right here. Now, your teacher might want you to, uh, 
depending on your uh, your class, uh, you, your teacher might actually expect you to use your background chemistry knowledge in order to identify whether a molecule will actually pass through the uh, cell membrane or not. I'm not going to go that much um, into depth here because the AP bio test is never going to ask you if a molecule is going to pass through the membrane or not like this because they don't expect you to understand whether a molecule is nonpolar or if it's small or not. However, I I even if you uh, if, if, if your AP biology teacher wants you to understand that, um, then you're going to obviously have to improve your chemistry skills in order to uh, in order to identify which molecules are actually small and nonpolar. I'm not going to be getting into what this means. However, if you do want to learn what this means, you can always go check out in our simple courses uh, at simplecourses.org. We uh, actually and um, in addition to AP Biology videos, which you're watching here, we also have uh, AP videos um, which are produced by Simple Chemistry, the Simple Chemistry team, and you can go learn about all the chemistry, uh, all the chemistry knowledge you need to need to be you need to be able to identify if a molecule actually is small and nonpolar or if a molecule is large or polar. Okay, so for right now, just know that I guess you just have to know the basic understanding that a molecule which is small and nonpolar is going to pass through the membrane. Okay, now in contrast to that, uh, a molecule which will not pass through a membrane are large molecules. So obviously that makes sense because the if you can see here, all the phospholipids are closely bunched up together so there's no room for a large molecule like this to try to pass through the membrane because you know it's, there's not enough space. Um, charged particles, uh, charged particles uh, for example like sodium or uh, potassium ion or uh, chlorine, chloride anion, uh, these are all charged and the reason why they're not going to pass through the membrane is because the hydrophobic region right here is going to prevent the, the, uh, these uh, these charged particles from passing because the hydrophobic region is nonpolar and nonpolar substances don't like to mix with uh, charged substances uh, because it's just of the charge imbalance. So because of that, um, charged particles can't pass through the membrane. Now also polar molecules can't pass through the membrane. Uh, examples of this are water, H2O, uh, that's a very big example of a polar molecule. Another um, example of a polar molecule, uh, I'm trying to think something in biology, uh, I guess something like uh, HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. Uh, that's not really something you'll see in biology as much, but you'll definitely see water uh, in biology. And water cannot pass through the membrane because it is polar. And, that, and the reason for that is because, again, we have the hydrophobic region right here. And since the hydrophobic region is is nonpolar and water is a polar molecule, it's not going to mix well. So a water molecule will not be able to pass through this hydrophobic region right there. It's going to be it's going to be stopped and it's going to be pushed back out. Okay. So because of that, we, we, we see this selective permeability of membranes. So which is good and all, but how does a cell ever uh, it can pass it can pass molecules like this, but what if the cell needs to pass molecules which are like this because sometimes the cell does need charged particles as well as polar molecules so how does it pass that so the way it solves this problem is it uses something called transport proteins okay so there's two types of transport proteins there are channel proteins and there are carrier proteins so let's first look at channel proteins i have a diagram of a channel protein right here this is a channel protein so channel proteins allow charge or polar molecules to pass through Okay, so for example, they would allow things like the water we see here, or the sodium ion, potassium ion, or the chloride anion to pass through. And the way they, they do that is, if you look here, we have, again, we have uh, our membrane right here. And then, we, as you can see here, there's a protein. So this protein actually uh, has kind of like this opening, which we are able to observe right here, this opening. And this opening, this these regions right here of the protein, are this whole region right here. Actually, let me use a different color just to get that better highlighting so you can actually see. So this region of the protein right here, okay, is actually going to be, uh, actually, I don't think I should use that term. It's actually going to be polar, okay? So although this region of the membrane is nonpolar, meaning something like H2O, which is polar, H2O is polar, is not going to be able to penetrate that nonpolar region. Instead, it can pass through here because this region 
of the channel protein is polar and it does mix well. So because of that, the H2O could pass through the channel protein. Same thing goes for um, for charged uh, particles. Charged particles can also pass something like uh, something like sodium could pass through these channel proteins right here. Okay, so those are how channel proteins work. Now, another type of transfer protein which allows for this are carrier proteins. So carrier proteins actually change shape. They change shape to transfer charge or polar molecules. So as you can see here, this is kind of like a channel. Uh, there's just an opening. Uh, trans carrier proteins actually um, have, like, you can see they change shape. So what will happen is, let's say this molecule was a polar molecule, and obviously the polar molecule is not going to be able to penetrate the nonpolar region right here. You know, it's not going to be able to penetrate the nonpolar. Whoops! It's not going to be able to penetrate the nonpolar region right here. That's not going to happen. Uh, and then maybe it needs a little assistance. It can't travel through a channel protein like here. So it's going to use this the carrier protein. So what's going to happen is you can kind of imagine it's going to go in here and it's going to fit nicely and what's going to end up happening is that this two ends of the protein are end up are going to end up like kind of snapping up up uh snapping okay so this is going to go in like this and then this end of the protein is going to snap together like this right and then this part is going to open up like this. So it's actually going to change shape. So you can imagine it's kind of like snapping and then opening on the other side over here. Okay. So when it does that, then the, this molecule, which is now going to be, uh, this molecule, which is now going to be, this nonpolar molecule, which is now going to be over here, will have the ability to just pass out like this. Okay. And since the, the protein is actually changing shape in this scenario, in this scenario, rather than just having like a channel like this, this is going to be classified as a carrier protein. Okay. Now, another important channel protein, which you need to know is aquaporins. This is probably the most important channel protein uh, because remember again, water is a polar molecule. Water is a polar molecule. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be able to pass through the membrane. However, we know that water is so vital to life. So the way water passes through the, the, um, the membrane is through a special type of channel protein called aquaporins, and aquaporins are channel proteins which transfer water. So just like how I use my example here with water, which is passing through the channel protein, if water is passing through a channel protein, that uh, that that type of channel protein where water passes through is called an aquaporin. And you can kind of think there the uh, the aqua part of the the aqua part is for water, you know, think of like in Spanish we say agua, you know, that might be a good way of thinking about this. So aqua and the pore, in, a pore, right, a pore is usually an opening and this channel protein has an opening for the water to go to. So that might be a good way of remembering this um, channel protein. This is one of the most important channel proteins which you need to know, so make sure you don't forget it. So that's all we have to, uh, you have to know about selective permeability. Hope this video helped. Selective permeability is as simple as that.